Um, so I'm very, I'm very happy that uh, we're starting the the sixth panel now already, and um, I'm very happy to introduce to you um, once again Françoise Davoine, a psychoanalyst from Paris, and Jerry from psychoanalyst from Austin Riggs in uh, Massachusetts. And then um, Alexander Fields is the one who is uh, always the one who's uh, the, the big bridge between us, um, always selecting wonderful case presenters and giving us a, a chance to look into the work, you're, you're, the amazing work you're doing in Ukraine. And uh, so um, it's it's been really a very, fruitful exchange and I think the meetings themselves um, have followed a, a very interesting uh, development. Each, each meeting is different and, uh, and after I introduce uh, Seri Kiroyok to you, I'll give you a small summary of the previous session. So there's a little bit of a connection between the different meetings we've had. Oksana, I stop here because I know. Oh, it's going simultaneously, right? Yes, yes, yes I, yeah. You're okay, just going. I'm a slow yes. learner. So anyway, um, it's a pleasure to introduce you, uh, Sri Kiryuk from Leaf, from Lemberg. Uh, he is a professor of psychiatry and psychotherapy at the National Medical University in Lviv. He is a psychiatrist, a psychotherapist with a psychoanalytic orientation, and he also works as a group therapist. Um, he's one of the leading pedagogues at the university in Lviv. And Dr. Kiyoliuk is also a priest and a consultant to the military, um, where he works as a pastor of the Orthodox Church of the Ukraine, meeting with soldiers there. So I, I think yeah, he's bringing to us a really wide array of uh, expertise and specialities, and, and we're very much looking forward to the case you're presenting. Now, last time we had a, a very interesting and I think somewhat troubling case, and, um, uh, uh, and I cannot say much about it. Um, because reflecting of how anxiety really, in, I think the last uh, meeting was, it was the only case um, where we had to ask the uh, patient for permission uh, to be presented, uh, which he gave us. Um, but uh, it, was a, it was a prisoner who had been tortured and uh, in, um, in Kherson and who had been in uh, Russian, uh, in Russian uh, prison for, I think, about 10 months. And he had been seen by uh, Dr. Kovalik, also at the uh, clinic in, in Lviv. And she had seen him for about uh, four, four meetings. Um, I don't want to go too much into the details of the case. Um, anyway, he, he, I think he remained very much puzzled uh, throughout the case presentation. And, uh, and I remember Alexander, when he told me that this was the case we would hear about, he said, it's a very unclear case. We don't know what's, what's happening with him. So I think it was very useful to hear him, but on the other hand, there was also a lot of anxiety steered up, I think, in the case presenter, in the people who listened to him. And what occurred to me afterwards was um, the question that I think came also up during the discussion is, you know, the enemy is not just outside of the Ukraine, but one is sometimes not so very certain who is inside the Ukraine. And I think mm -hmm. this case was one where because he had information uh, on materials that we didn't know about, there was a great deal of anxiety about him and one didn't really know who one uh, was dealing with. So I think this is not the case for tonight. Uh, Siri, you said you discussed the information well enough, so there's no necessity to ask him to be presented. And uh, 
But again, I think it was troublesome as it was, and it, it was very interesting. And I think it brought also to light um, that the clear distinction, the distinctions are not so very clear, even within the Ukraine, of who are the people who are on our side and who are potentially also a hidden enemy. I don't, I don't know whether, Alexander, whether you felt it the same way, but that, that's really what stuck with me. Alexander, Fils, do you want to say something? Did you have that same impression or, or, or do you want to add something to it? I'll just say a couple of words. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would like to say a few words. That case was for us uh, very important and complex in terms of understanding of our own selves because our doctor, Sulemia Kovalek, as I said before, and as John said, right before the presentation, she felt a very uh, strong discomfort in terms of ethics of presenting this patient. And we discussed it for a long time and we thought that this acute feeling of ethical discomfort can be could be a projective identification of the patient's own problem. So this is a, a very count, uh, complex counter transferring formed and this is not the only case and we have to understand it well. And the discussion we had last time uh, gave us a lot of useful tips and uh, set things in order in our heads. And we realized that we have to be very careful about everything that the patients are, uh, are saying and analyze ourselves. That's why the discussion was complex last time, but it was extremely useful for us at the same time. Another thing I would like to say is that we're probably at a certain psychoanalytic front line where we uh, come across situations we have never encountered before. And it's really important for us to discuss them with you, to consult you uh, as we did uh, in our one of our previous discussions about the space being formed between us and the patients. And this space can provide a lot of information for us. So I will stop and not take up any time and I give the floor to Jean. No, just, just one thing. I wanted to say that I was in Vienna recently and we spoke to Jean, with Jean that uh, the interest in our platform is uh, gradually growing, not just in our Ukrainian community, but also in our uh, colleagues from other countries. And I will be uh, consulting John asking how we can wide broaden our circle in the future, uh, or maybe make a, an, intermediate conference of, of a kind. And so, so I, I'm gonna stop now. So um, thank you, for Alexander. Um, since I remember how much you uh, liked Jerry's concept two sessions ago about the potential, uh, the potential of the transitional space and then also the potential collapse of the transitional space, um, but there was a uh, concept you introduced uh, at the end. I want to open the potential and transition space now to Siri and uh, in his case, we have uh, we have an hour and forty five minutes, so we should have a, a lot of time for the case and for the case presentation and uh, and for a large discussion at the beginning with Francois and Jerry and then the topic. So, George, yes? No, you have to push the English button. And then you get that you then you get the whole thing in English. 
uh, there is a that they it gives you the choice of either Ukrainian or English, and you have to push. You have to push the English button. I know, I know. Well, it, it's all new to us because look, if you look, did you find it? It's if you look down on the bar where it says chat. Remember? Okay, so here I have it in German. It says. Uh, Bildschirm freigeben, aufzeichnen, and then it gives you the choice of English or Ukrainian before the reactions. Look at the button. Do you see it? George, it might say interpretation. And, and do you have a button for reactions? Like you just raise the hand? And what is there before? What what's the button before? Oh my god. Alexander Phil suggests that you press each button in turn and then you will find interpretation in one of them. Press each button, press the participants chat. No, he's not there. Can you help him? <laughs> What? No, no, wait, wait, wait. Well, we're taking care of you. What? Oh, okay. George? George, listen to me. The, the uh, Peter and his assistant are going to send you a link in the chat that will allow you to turn into English. Just for you. A private chat. No, it will come. Did you get it? No. Ah. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Oh, George. <laughs> they send you a picture of where the where the uh, language. Uh, okay. Okay. Maybe, maybe, um, uh, Eva? Können Sie, er, er kriegt's nicht. Er kriegt's nicht. Können wir ihm irgendwas anderes noch schicken? No? Okay. All right. <lacht> Oh, so, nee, nee, das geht nicht. Okay, so why don't we start and uh, we'll figure out a way for George. Siri, can you start presenting your case? Yes, I'm ready. Hello. Hello, dear uh, moderator, dear psychotherapeutic community and it's an honor for me to be your presenter for tonight and i would like to present a case of my client and as i said before i've disguised uh, all possible things uh, that could identify her uh, while leaving the content the way it the same as it was and this client i asked her permission uh, to tell her story 
and she gave me a full uh, right to even uh, say her real name, but uh, I think I was facing also a dilemma of how ethical it would be to present her personal information. And I usually say that for my clients, I am also an advocate and I'm on my client's side. And as sometimes an advocate protects uh, the personal data, I decided that I'm going to disguise her nevertheless. So her name is Victoria, she's 40. She's single, she's not married, but she is in a relationship Ukraine, of Ukrainian nationality. And she comes from uh, the Kherson region. And I think this is the most important thing. Um, why I'm presenting this case is that she is a woman who has uh, lived uh, through the entire occupation of Kherson region starting from February 24th of last year uh, till 11th of November 2022. And that was eight months, two weeks and four days. And during all this time, she stayed in Kherson region at her place. And um, what was the story of our acquaintance? As a priest, I am a member of an organization uh, called Eleos Ukraine. And it uh, does a social, it performs social ministry. And we have a memorandum of understanding that for people who have a need in crisis uh, psychotherapeutic uh, help, I provide 10, uh, 10 uh, meetings online as a volunteer. So this is how this client ended up with me. She was among the patients uh, I uh, work with as a volunteer. Uh, all our meetings were online. We have in met in person. And she, uh, she was in uh, seven meetings. She has been in seven meetings uh, so far, and she has three more to go. I met her for the first time. Uh, uh, when I met her for the first time, I already had some uh, initial information about her. That was on the 15th of November, four days after the occupation of Kherson region on the 11th of November. And the, uh, the battle of Kherson uh, resulted in Ukraine's victory and uh, escape of Russian troops uh, to the uh, left bank of the Dnieper. And uh, then my client was able to leave Kherson region and all meetings uh, uh, were, um, uh, during our meeting, she was in Kiev and I was in Lviv. The first meeting was uh, on November 15th, as I already said. Another thing I would like to add, that she is a high functioning person who has a PhD in history in Europe. And... Uh, when she was, when she became a professor, she came back to her uh, uh, home uh, town because she was really interested in uh, studying relationship of her region with another uh, Oriental country, and this was the topic of her research, and it was her conscious conscious choice to stay in her son region. The first meeting we had. When she went online, it was like crisis intervention. And right away I asked her if she was in a safe place because uh, 
because uh, I learned before that she had uh, been in adversity. She confirmed she was in a, a safe place now. She uh, felt uh, okay. She was not hungry or thirsty. She was in a warm place. And I didn't, just, I didn't have to worry about any uh, threats to her life uh, here and now during our meeting. During these first 50 minutes, I had this feeling. I often use this metaphor for myself as a counter-transference metaphor. I had this feeling that I am a big ship in a, a stormy sea because there was a lot of uh, difficult information she was providing from the first moments. She told me she was warned on the 25th or 26th of February that they would come for her because she was a proactive person. And from February 26th, she had been hiding uh, in basements uh, changing uh, her uh, places of residence and she would only come out at night to find food and water. And she was using her phone uh, to contact her friends and get information of where it would be safe for her to stay. Uh, besides this story of uh, true survival, she told me that when she was in the basement, <laughs> she saw people being shot. She saw people being dragged by the hair. And she um, also heard uh, shouts and, and a especially difficult situation was when she really nearly died when uh, the occupiers were walking around the basements and one of them who was a collaborant and he was calling out in Ukrainian uh, saying, come out, it's safe, come out. But something kept her back and not uh, get out of the cellar. And she describes this as a very scary moment. And uh, um, another a difficult moment she was describing. She just did it all on her own. I didn't ask her anything. And she said the most difficult uh, time was when on the 24th of August, which is Ukraine Independence Day, she was still in the basement. And three Russian uh, soldiers were standing outside and she uh, really uh, like uh, this extreme urge to uh, get out and kill them. And she said that uh, she, uh, si since she was a child, she was practicing uh, martial, oriental martial arts. And uh, I knew that it was quite real for me to kill them all, but I stayed and I didn't get out and I didn't kill them. Then she was describing her very acute experience that of being left, being forgotten, and this was not was not going to end, and that this occupation would last forever, and that she had been forgotten. And uh, so she uh, she was pouring out all this during our first meeting, I felt like this big ship uh, and in this stormy, stormy sea, overwhelmed by all this. But when I have this feeling, I usually remember this myth that the oil is carried in tankers in a single space, that it's a myth that actually tanker has a lot of layers and a lot of cells and the oil is uh, um, is placed in different in different levels, and so this uh, makes a tanker, an oil tanker, a relatively stable vessel even in stormy seas. And the th another thing I 
uh, felt in this first meeting, I was, I was uh, remembering that this information can be separated in blocks and then it's not so overwhelming and scary. And then uh, I said two uh, short remarks during our first meeting. The first thing was, uh, I said I was glad that uh, she was uh, with me here and now, I, uh, that I realized that her emotions were very strong, but this also meant that she was alive and she was here with me there and then, and I could feel her strong emotions. And I also said that, and my other remark was uh, this metaphor about the, the oil tanker. And uh, by the end of the meeting, I suggest that uh, we have a meeting ne the next day. Yeah. The client agreed. And we met the day after. And during the first 30 minutes, she was going on like during our first meeting, but I was a little braver and I was trying to talk to her. And uh, I said to her, yes, these strong emotions are there and you're alive. And probably something, uh, you had some kind of resource some support that allowed you to survive in uh, this adversity. Let us think to together what, uh, what uh, it could have been. And the client said, yes, I, I think I know what it is. When I was 20, I was diagnosed with a uh, acute leukemia, which was treated successfully. And I think that was the worst uh, physical state I've ever had when I was uh, in hospital and I didn't know whether I was going to survive or not, but I did survive. And this staying in the basement probably was not as physically hard as, uh, as that episode with my uh, grave disease. And I'm really glad about that. And I, and then I said, let us uh, think some more. What allowed you to stay put and not get out to and kill the occupiers? Because in, in my opinion, you, you did well. You, you did the right thing because that was dangerous. And she said, yes, as, a, as an athlete, I held back because in martial arts, the most uh, important thing is, is uh, reserve and ability to uh, give an, a precise blow, but I didn't know if uh, there were any other occupiers around the corner, so I held back. Another thing she said was that she was really supported by, by uh, that the, she was thinking about her chaperone who was taking care of her in her son region. And she thought about this woman as of someone who supported her all along. And she thought frequently about that chaperone lady. Okay, that was the end of our second meeting. And I also suggest that we meet the next day again. And during our third meeting, the client uh, comes online from a car and she, uh, she says, I have, to, I have to take a ride uh, for a while. And she turns the phone for me to see her chaperone uh, who was with her in the car. And I asked, I asked them where uh, they were going. And she said, you know, I don't know uh, why God gave me this opportunity to exit this serious situation alive. And I thought that perhaps I have a kind of a mission uh, to complete. And I met my chaperone and she suggested that we go to a shelter 
for uh, women who were raped to uh, talk to them and to spend some time with them. So think of this situation. She just, she was just out of the occupation herself and now she's uh, going to visit the raped women in the shelter. I, it, it was not my, uh, up to me to interfere. I just said that uh, I uh, supported her in her decision. And, uh, uh, and I, and I said that if you had then uh, that we have still time and then she interrupts connection and then comes back on uh, in 20 minutes and during these 20 minutes I've been think I was thinking about her and thinking about what uh, I should do with her in therapy because this This paradigm of understanding the well uh, being as Aristotle described it, it's probably not working when you. Uh, so it would probably would not be effective to uh, talk to her about being about her well being and that I should better uh, shift from this hedonistic paradigm to a different one to. Uh, me changing uh, under the influence of the circumstances. And then this thought emerged. Uh, it was, it also uh, was inspired by our previous meeting here. Uh, after Salomia Kovalik's case, I thought I would tell her that she could also, her mission could always be witnessing the terrible things. And she was a, a PhD in history. She uh, was good at writing at uh, presenting her thoughts. And then she comes back online and I tell her that. And she, and her face lights up and she says, right, I can, I can do that. And in my opinion, I've, she was stable at the time. And, um, and after stabilization, I usually uh, suggest that my clients uh, pick a time for the meeting according to their needs. And then she, she uh, did not contact me for about a month. And uh, then uh, at the end of December, she wrote to me that she wanted to talk. So we met and she said, you know what? I, I've given a few interviews. I start, I'm starting to describe all these events. And I uh, really liked this idea. Uh, I really want to be a witness. I want to be a witness to other people uh, being alive about things I had have seen. Uh, as to her quality of life, she said that she was living like on two whales. Uh, she said, I, I'm uh, standing on two whales, but they are, I cannot quite understand them. On one, on the one hand, one whale is helplessness and apathy when I lay, lie down in my bed and I cannot move. And the other is irritation. And uh, she says that she cannot understand either of these states. She doesn't know what to do with that. But in this irritation, she remains productive and she gives interviews and she writes. And then I was thinking that the world was uh, believed to rest on three whales. And I asked her where the third whale was. And she said she didn't know where the third whale was. And I, can, I could see that she was shivering and I 
made a suggestion that perhaps she uh, had anxiety that something might happen. She said, right, this is a kind of foreboding that things are not calm. And I reminded her again, uh, like during our first meetings that all your, uh, all her emotions were valid and adequate and everything she did was valid and adequate. And the, the only inadequate thing was the war. The rest uh, was adequate. And uh, then I opened up about the anxiety. I realized well that on the one hand my anxiety is very unpleasant but when it it abandons me i stop being creative and i said that perhaps your anxiety uh, can have this dual nature that on one hand it's not really comfortable physically but it urges you to accomplish things and the client was was happy about that. And this is when our meeting ended. The fifth, sixth, and seventh meetings, uh, I think I will uh, share my screen now and then speak about those. Uh, OK. I'm not very good at drawing, but this is what I could do. I was thinking about about the uh, Karpman's triangle, about a victim, aggressor, and savior. And I was also thinking about the professor uh, Papadopoulos Rhombus, where there's another angle added, which is witness. And um, uh, neither the triangle uh, nor the uh, rhombus fit here, something was lacking. And uh, so when I sat down and uh, let my mind wander free, I, I opened this rhombus of Professor Papadopoulos and uh, I added another point, a hero. And to my mind, it uh, can be present there, at least with uh, with the part of people who are uh, living through this war. And I would like to stop and uh, on a few details uh, we worked on. First of all, I really wanted uh, her not to end up as a victim of identity. Because if she had uh, had decided that she was a victim, then this person had to uh, receive enough help and at the same time not uh, be able to survive, not be able to survive without help. And um, if I saw her as a victim of identity, I think I would see her state as more pathological and it would not be support, but uh, care. And I, I, and this was a, a way to disability, and I was really afraid of that, because with other clients, I usually try to be really careful with uh, all of my words. This client is not a victim of identity. During our first meeting, she was she perceived herself as a victim of circumstances. And then this uh, bubble of her personality, uh, the personality that survived the events, from this bubble, from the field close to the victim of identity started moving towards, uh, as I show in errors, to the 
uh, to the aggressor. Uh, and I asked her if there was a moment when she uh, became the aggressor. And thinking about the Cartman's uh, triangle and Papadopoulos rhombus, I realized that this person can uh, oscillate between these identifications. And I noted this moment when she became the aggressor, it was really brief. And uh, my uh, priest part helped me because I never, uh, I usually tell all of my clients that I'm a priest and I'm ready to discuss different topics. And during our sixth meeting, she said, you know, I guess there's no God. You know, God blinked. when uh, everything, all these woes were around me. And what do you say? Of course, I didn't have an answer to, uh, to these questions, but I sort of turned our conversation back to, to not blinking, that you were the one who saw all this and you can witness about all these uh, terrible things so they do not happen again. And she was satisfied with this answer of mine. And when she was a savior was the moment when she uh, was driving her chaperone to the shelter uh, with the, the, all these raped women. And it was a good thing. In my opinion, it was good that she uh, didn't stay in that volunteering activity because that would probably be too triggering for her. And she moved towards witness. And the witness, uh, in terms of her uh, aim, goals in life, it's understandable. Very interesting experiences that I, I, were, I was having. I was thinking that maybe our European colleagues also may have these thoughts and they can be a little misleading with regard to, to the severity of this state. Because as a witness, this person is not, is uh, resilient and not helpless. There also can be this feeling that the war does not always have negative consequences and war is the suffering. And again, it can also uh, carry an economic threat. This, is also, this also has to do with ethical uh, decisions because this may decrease uh, the financing of rehabilitation programs. I also added this uh, hero stance. I think that this uh, stance is really important and necessary for Ukraine now, right now. And it's a uh, really good to uh, present all the truly heroic deeds, but this probably will not be happening forever. And we can remember the example of Israel where every other person uh, participated in the hostilities or in warfare, or was an active witness and uh, performed heroic deeds. But for now, Ukraine, is in the position where we really need our heroes to keep our morality up and our witnesses, the ones that I mentioned. I think I said the main things. And in my opinion, um, this uh, using this client as an example, I think that with a part of clients who have, who uh, have been through similar experience, it is worth to 
to uh, make the shift from hedonistic paradigm to to the to this paradigm of well-being because how can we comfort a person who lost their loved ones their uh, house their belongings you cannot uh, comfort them in any way but the comfort uh, we can offer is can be this uh, uh, thing that yes i have been through a uh, through adversity war is disgusting but i can uh, do things and i have enough alternatives i can pick from to take action so that would be it thank you thank you so very much dr Kriyor. uh there was a very unusual wonderful case um you know our first woman our first female case as well and uh, uh it, it it was also touching because she uh you know from the region that she came so there's also some uh a path from uh, the last patient who was tortured in um what's the city in K K Kurs Kurson. and now this patient so we get a sort of picture of what you know uh internally of uh, her hiding in the ba basement there for weeks and months and the other patient having been tortured probably in a basement in in Kurson. so thank you very much i, I do want to open the discussion now to uh, jerry from and francois Stravon. maybe you have some questions before you at for Dr. Uh, Kiryok, um, if not, please go ahead. Yes, uh, my question is, uh, when she was in the basement, it was in Kherson? Yeah. Yes, it was Kherson uh, region, not the city itself, but yeah. it was uh, Kherson region. Uh, I'm I'm a country side. Something now, Jan. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. That's what I'm saying. I I gave okay. the floor to you. I was very uh, uh, impressed by your image of the oil tanker, because I did not know how it is inside, and the thing that you used, being overwhelmed by the first session, everything she was. Given. And the, the way you did uh, take different parts helped her because uh, I was very, very uh, struck when you say, I became braver at the second session. And so you could help her to uh, use and to tell you. She, she knew you were a priest. So she could tell you about her despair, her not believing in God, and through that, how she could use herself, what she went through, wanting to kill and did not do it, to be a witness and not, a, not an objective witness. I remember Dori Laub, Dori Laub, who is an Ukrainian analyst, well, coming from Ukraine, deported at six years old in Romania, where, went to Israel and then Yale, at Yale, where he said, you have to be a witness for events without a witness. And that's what she did. Uh, and I like this definition. It's not a witness like a, only, you know, or in a, a scientist or a, it's from her experience that she uh, observed, she, she witnessed, she went to help those women. And the second thing he said, those people always ask you, who are you? This is the heroic part. The heroic part is not one person doing big deal but it's an interaction. Who are you? You are there in the same place where I am. 
you know about danger, you know about life threat. That's what she went through, like the women. And so it's, it's a really powerful interaction between your experience, her experience, and the other women uh, who were all alone in their, in their... So that's what I wanted to tell you for the moment. Thank you. Jerry, do you want to follow up? I know it's always difficult after Francoise. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I, I, I will simply agree with everything Francoise said, as always. <laughs> but actually, I had a, I had a, I, there were a couple of things I didn't understand. I, I, and I think I maybe misheard the words, but was one of the words whale? Wait, yeah. What, what does that mean? A whale, like an animal, sea mammal. Oh, a whale. So it, like in, uh... mm -hmm. yeah. Moby like Dick. In... Like in Moby like Dick. Like in Moby right? Dick. Yes. <laughs> but I don't understand how it's being used in this in this situation. That she uh, was standing, she was resting on two whales. As if one, one whale was helplessness and the other one was the, her irritation. Yeah. Um, and, and, uh, and, and Seri said something about there being a third whale. Yes, yeah. because the metaphor of the ancient uh, world uh, construction was like uh, people that says that the world is resting on three whales. Aha. Uh -huh. You know this metaphor about three whales, the 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 earth resting on three whales and or three. Uh, I, no, I I did not know that. Um, it's very interesting. I. It's a, yes. it's a new it's a new metaphor for me um, so uh, I don't I don't know what to make of it exactly uh, well let's see what, what can I say I, I too was was very impressed with with your work Sergi. it was uh, and with your patient um, and um, and in a way you know I think you might have described it as uh, first aid work and you can kind of hear that. Um, but I, I think it goes deeper than that. And, um, and when she asked you about God, in a way, I, I heard that as the, an example of what Francois said about who are you. And um, it seems to me that your answer said something along the lines of, uh, I'm a person who can be with you in whatever you believe. Um, and uh, I can be with you, who are who is a person who is not blinking, and I and I cannot blink with you. And in a sense, I don't I don't have to fall back on my own beliefs here. <coughs> Excuse me. So I thought that was very important. Um, I found myself thinking that over time um, there may be moments when the sort of idiosyncratic trouble of her life comes into an understanding of what's happening with her right now. Um, and I must say, you know, here we are at the Sigmund Freud Museum. So I associated the two whales with the two parents and, and wondered about uh, the stability of the parental foundation that she stands on. And, uh, but before that, I found myself thinking about her feeling that she had been totally forgotten. And, and I, I wondered about that. I wondered about her experience in life of being forgotten. Um, you know, the terrible things a person goes through during, during war, um, during trauma in general, many of them are, uh, you know, simply things one has to survive. Um, some of them are things that touch a person in their, in their place of vulnerability, which I think in a sense is also a place of strength, but first of all, it's a place of vulnerability. And so I wondered about, <clears throat> about that. Um, I wondered about 
you know, what she had seen of rape, for example, and how that was moving her toward taking her chaperone to the rape center. <coughs> Excuse me, but basically I love the work and I, I, I love hearing about your, your bravery and your patient's bravery and I thank you for it. I may yes, add yes, something, yeah. I may add something after Jerry. Uh, you, you, she went through leukemia. She had seen death in front of her beforehand and that was a resource and the same way she could use her fear terror not to be paralyzed but to overcome it and to use it you know danger the fear of danger is as you told her or anxiety that was wonderful when you said anxiety is not a pathological it's a, it's it's useful it's a source of life that's what you say and that it was very powerful i think i'll say something quickly and then uh, alexander and george um i so agree and i want to uh, remind you of what francois said in a previous session is that uh, we, we are learning so much from you. I mean, you come to Francoise and Jerry and they can give you very useful and wonderful comments, but we're also learning so much from you. So that, that's a, it's a wonderful way to be able to listen into your work. And um, I was, uh, I just wanted to follow up on what Jerry also said. Um, that that sort of small sentence about um, that she, uh, after she had survived all this incursion, that she thought she would never be found, that she felt she was she was lost and nobody would remember her. And I think in a in a very small way, she repeats that in a reverse order with you when she uh, hangs up and uh, you don't hear from her when she uh, brings the chaperone to the rape center so for 20 minutes you know you you don't know where she is is she going to call you back is she coming back or what and I think that you were there after she called you back you know having done what she did I think was a great um, just that was a great help to her and gave us some sense that she can leave you and she left you also within the sessions four months, but you'll be there. And this, I think, uh, when we know very little about her early childhood, I think was very, very uh, important to her. Thank you. Alexander, you're next. And then there's George. Thank you for this opportunity to uh, speak and with your permission, I would uh, say one comment uh, to Serhi as our a participant of all our staffs where we discuss uh, uh, our patients psychodynamically. Serhi is someone who has very apt metaphors um, when we discuss uh, psychodynamic or psychoanalytical aspects of our patients and I think that this really helps Sirhi uh, in his uh, crisis work because one or two uh, apt metaphors can be of great help. Another thing, I, I didn't know this case that he was uh, going to present because we didn't see each other uh, for the last 10 days and we, we haven't discussed that. And I was really struck by this case because I thought how uh, Sirhi managed to to uh, identify one of the most important foci of work with this patient, because this patient is a historian and and. Uh, a researcher and also an athlete. And Sirhi, while working with her, he told her that, you know, we have 
to to consider uh, various aspects of your identity after occupation. Mm -hmm. Why did I think about that? It was not accidental because uh, now in wartime, we have to think a lot. Uh, we have to contemplate uh, many uh, different options of identity because this war is aimed at distracting our Ukrainian <laughs> identity as such. And there are many situations here uh, which uh, question our previous identity. You have to leave your home, abandon your profession, uh, change uh, your uh, roles rapidly, work in crisis situations. People who are used to working continuously and calmly, and now you have to be very immediate and uh, and so there's a lot of uh, this is a huge load on on our identity, and I think that Sir uh, uh, suggested um, she used her other identities, uh, which allowed her to use her personal resource. Mm. And this makes me think about what relational analysts say that we have a few selves and our uh, so he has two selves at least and uh, they are of equal power. He, uh, on, on one hand, he's a psychoanalytic therapist and a priest. And uh, I had this paradoxical idea that so he, is a person who can switch between identities depending on the situation. Perhaps I think this was, not, I don't want to say counter transference kind of thing, but the analytical aspect of his counseling was that he, being able to switch identities depending on the circumstances, he suggested that the patient do the same, switch her identities mm -hmm. quickly. Mm -hmm while abandoning her basic identity of a historian, a researcher, and she was able to make use of it because, uh, because he opened up to her as relational analysts uh, do. And I think this very mechanism worked because I'm thinking that if, if he uh, had told her that he, she had to think about going back to her profession, maybe uh, go into a different town, look for a job uh, of a historian, maybe that would have been good, but maybe it would was not unrealizable for her and not useful for her. And she uh, just suggested she use other identities, be a hero for a while, be a supportive person, be a witness. And this is what I wanted to say. This relational analytical aspect has worked very well in this situation. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. George, you're next. You have to unmute yourself, George. Okay, I'm here. Yes, now, now we hear you. Mm -hmm. First of all, you have done excellent work with this woman. As far as I see her, she may contact you again, but I almost feel she's cured of the problem that she came to you with. Um, now, um, actually, I disagree a bit about the PTSD. I don't think she's going to be a victim of PTSD. She's clearly traumatized. But I think this is what Gislan was talking about with um, contiguous uh, adult onset trauma. Uh, and the work that you did with her, I believe, is an excellent example of that. I don't think she's in danger of flashbacks and all the other stuff that we see with, with genuine uh, PTSD. As far as her belief in God, um, it's a strange kind of non-belief because I don't think she really stopped her belief. I think she was praying that you can restore God to her. I think she's a religious person. It's no accident that she contacted you of all the people who might have been able to help her. Um, you're God's representative, for God's sake. Uh, and as a result, 
Um, she, by the way, religious people seem, to, even though I'm not religious, I still believe it's true, but religious people seem to deal with hardship a bit better than people who are not religious. Um, and I believe she was hoping that you would um, reinstate God in her mind, and she would not only regain agency, she'd, she'd regain agency because of the strength he gave her, you gave her, uh, and she was going to be a witness. She was not going to be a victim. She was, and by the way, even in terms of history, um, historians record history and witness what's going on and talk about it and need to talk about it. Um, no, it's just, the, 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 there's so much I could say that, but all of that's praise. Uh, by the way, um, as Jean herself said, I believe when all of this is over and even already now, the experts in trauma who are consulted are going to be consulting people uh, in the Ukraine. You people per, are going to learn more about it than we, than we, than we know. Um, I have a couple of questions. First of all, I'm not sure I understand the function or the person of the chaperone. To me, a chaperone is someone, usually an older aunt, uh, who accompanies somebody to not get in trouble. So I'd like to know a little bit about the chaperone and her role, or his or her role. And second, I wonder if you, Sergei, have ever been in a similar situation, personally life-threatening in this war? I mean, I know everybody's in the Ukraine is threatened, but I wonder if you have shared any part of her concrete experience yourself. That's it. Well, these days I spent in Kyiv and uh, in one of the trainings, we had to feel the threat which was really strong when the safe place, one of the safest places in Kyiv, uh, the person who was monitoring uh, the threat said, well, we, we have to go to the shelter because uh, we might uh, be injured if we were not in shelter. So I was in uh, that kind of situation these days. Um, these past few days that I spent in KU, because there were six air raid alerts in KU just during the, the last day. Hmm. And what about the chaperone? How, uh, that was George's other question. А оця патронеса, якби, тому що шаперон, ти казав, це якби той, хтось такий, хто суп... That lady uh, was uh, was like her maybe her com companion that she uh, she uh, was living in the same district and she uh, shared her hobbies of martial arts and she was the one to involve my client in the martial arts and she was the one who taught her this important thing of being reserved and she mm. when she when she was in the basements at night she was thinking about that lady that companion uh, and thinking that she was the one who taught her to be reserved 
And this memory of this lady and this reserve of hers allowed her not to get out of the basement to go and kill these invaders, these Russian soldiers. So she was a protector. Yes. Maybe she was her sensei, as it's called in uh, in martial in Oriental martial mm. arts. Her teacher. Exactly. Yes, probably. Mm. Well, it sounds like uh, you call it reserve, and it sounds like that came in at another crucial moment is when she was almost betrayed. You said that there was a soldier who screamed in Ukrainian, it's safe, come out. And something inside of her didn't trust that. So again, she, it seems to me that that's when she also relied on this reserve, not to react right away, but to sort of trust her intuition and, 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 and not come out of her hiding place. So this the chaperone played, I think, internally in an amazingly important role to her. Other comments, other questions. Uh, I wanted to, Francoise, yes, not uh, because you are a priest. Speaking of of martial art. And speaking of Japan, after the big uh, Fukushima disaster with many, many people died, uh, th there is a testimony of a Zen monk who performed, he was obliged to greet people who were invaded by ghosts, thousands of them. And they came to him for this dimension, this dimension of the sacred, you know, of the beyond, whatever you call it, you know, whatever you put as a name for what is beyond our, uh, uh, what's going on. So this, this, I don't know if it's a third or a fourth dimension, but it's something that, do you have to deal with that? That is because she brings you also this kind of uh, fight. She's a very, very good athlete, but also expert in that uh, culture. Did you, uh, were they fight also? All right, go on. <laughs> it's a question. Well, yes. As a, a person of martial arts, she was taken, she took part in competitions and she uh, won trophies. Of all the, th all the things she was involved in, she was always successful in all of them. She uh, uh, won over her illness. She took trophies uh, in martial arts. And in her profession, she also reached the highest level. At least these three points of resource. Mm -hmm. Gina, if I'm I could, thinking if I could... of her feminine identity. Of the identity that maybe it was maybe a little weaker, but now she has this identity of a hero, of a fighter, of a warrior, and these basements, and this is this is a masculine story. And I, 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 I was thinking, I was picturing myself in her place, and I was thinking that maybe uh, our weaknesses become our uh, strength in such extraordinary circumstances. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and now she's only 40. Can I jump in? And there's uh, a, lot of, a lot of years yeah, when, of when she's done. ahead of her. Oh, Sorry. I'm done, okay. Uh, Jerry, and then whoever else, just raise your hand so I can see uh, better who, who's, 
who's who wants to speak. Jerry. Well, yes, I <clears throat> I wanted to um, kind of think about a sequence in what you presented to us, Seri. Uh. Uh, in on that, uh, I think the third session, the one in which she uh, showed you her chaperone and the phone call was interrupted for a while. Uh, I, I I wrote down that you you said that she said something like I don't know why God gave me this opportunity, uh, this mission, she said, and um, I thought that was very interesting and um, and it led you it seems to me to uh, to a, a thought in your own mind <clears throat> which was simply working with her about her own well-being was not was not useful now but I should shift to, to a different paradigm you said and 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 the paradigm you shifted to was for her to have a role, not, not just about her well-being, but a, a role in the whole picture. And the role was as, as witness. <clears throat> and you linked that up with her profession, with her profession as a historian. And by the way, I was interested in the subject of her dissertation, which was the relationship between her region and some other region I didn't really pick up who the, which region that was, but it was, a, it was an interesting idea. Anyway, um, so you say something about the mission of being a witness, and she says, I can do that. And in fact, you say to her, you already have done that as a historian. And then there's an interruption. You say to her, come back to me when, when you want to. And she does um, a, a while later. <clears throat> and she tells you about uh, something about, she says, I want to be a witness. And she says, I'm living on two whales and I can't understand them. One being her helplessness and apathy, the other being her irritation. It's, I was listening for what she wanted from her therapy at that point. And what she said was, I'd like to understand these. And she added something very interesting, which is the anxiety is unpleasant, but when it abandons her, she stops being creative. And I, I thought, I, I think at some point that will be an interesting area of work. That is the work around abandonment and, and, um, and uh, being abandoned by both her anxiety and her creativity. Um, I, don't, I don't know what to make of it, but I, I think as I heard it, that was the uh, that was the place beyond the crisis intervention that she was saying, "I need to understand something with you, and I need your help about that." And um, <clears throat> and will you stay with me even if I don't believe what you believe? Mm -hmm. But you have. To we have to say that the anxiety can be a resource that was not what she said, it was what said he said. To her. I'm not sure I understood this, Alexander. It was not Sir he who told her that it was, I mean, it was not the patient who said that. Uh, the idea that uh, the anxiety can be helpful and can be a resource uh, for uh, being energetic and creative. Uh, she didn't say that, Sir, he did. Yeah. That was the resource that Sir, he uh, extracted from himself. Didn't she say uh, when she's irritated, she's productive? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, anxiety. Yeah. The anxiety, the irritation, yeah. She, she was the one to say that she was uh, creative, productive when she was irritable. Yeah. It was about, mm -hmm. And then you Not, just translated it into anxiety, the irritation, yeah. right? Yeah. But I, I was also trying to underline 
the word abandoned. Yeah. Right. Now, I think it's interesting that um, we know nothing about her earlier life. The, what we've known, the earliest we've known is that she, when she was 20, uh, uh, she had uh, uh, cancer um, and succeed in that. But we have no idea, and I'm not, I'm not sure what they, she's told you in between, um, about her, her childhood or adolescence, whether abandonment played any uh, uh, a part of that. Do, do you know more about that by now, Siri? Well, she was raised in a family with those parents and her uh, parents uh, reside in Hifzor region as well. They didn't leave the region. They also were in occupation, but they were living in a small village where the occupiers did not go. Well, she, she didn't describe her childhood in detail. Well, I, I'm not going to fantasize about things I don't know. Because mm -hmm. she, she didn't say much about that. Mm -hmm. It didn't come up. Mm -hmm. so, I want to. I, Jerry, go over first. No. I may say something. Okay. Both of us. Yeah, go ahead. So, but I, I am very, when you say there is history and identity, she changed. As Alexander said, there is a new herself coming out in the circle. But it's. She's still an historian, but a different way. She's in the history in the making. She is there. She was there. She will be there. And this is history that usually in books are little by little if they get out of books because there is all those anxiety, fear, danger. And perhaps she will become creative, creative anew way to tell history. You know, those parts of history, which afterward are completely put out, put in the leftovers. And she's building history in the making now yeah. and fighting for it. I think her two identities are together. And another, uh, my other question, which stays in my mind, when she refused to kill the three uh, Russians, you know, martial arts teach you to fight and not to fight sometimes. Mm -hmm. When you evaluate how many people would be killed after those three ones on the other side. What we call, I don't know the English word in French, représailles. You killed one person and 50 are killed. The reprisal. So there will be a reprisal of 50 I people heard for a one lot you kill. I heard a lot of them. I remember people uh, holding back because they knew that the consequence would be, uh, you know, awful. Mm. Perhaps that she thought about that. Mm. That's a question, two questions. History in the making with sensibi sensitivity, with what the body teaches you, not only the mind, uh, this link. And second, to fight will be not to fight. And yeah, would you like Serhi to comment on that? Mm -hmm. She would like to, he, she, yeah. Francoise would like a response. Yes, she uh, makes an impression of a person who creates history, and this is a living history. It's not, it's not a 
moth-eaten history from the closet, you know, or a, a moth-eaten book from the bookcase. It's really fresh, just coming out of the uh, out of print, and it's still hot and it's living. Mm -hmm. Uh, Francois, there was, uh, yeah, go ahead. That moment, I think she also, uh, uh, she says it to uh, Cerny, when, uh, when she wants to kill the three Russians, she, she thinks of the chaperone, she thinks of the martial arts, and she says a, a, a very important part of uh, fighting in martial arts is when not to fight because otherwise she says something like when you you have to wait to get to get a good punch and it sounds like she realized that she wouldn't be in a good position to give a good punch to probably kill three three men at the same time so this sort of waiting and not reacting right away and choosing her time carefully i think it was go through the whole case uh, presentation today. George? It seems to me she was always a fighter. Huh. She learned martial arts before she knew the Russians were going to attack. Yeah. Uh, That's why. Uh, and she's a woman with tremendous ego strength. She is motivated to do something to do something about the world, to do something about herself. Um, and apparently um, she lost that sense, which is why she contacted you and you gave it back to her. Mm. Uh, this, is, this is a woman who, who is, she is a hero, but she was, she's been a hero probably since, uh, since she was a kid. Uh, uh, there's, yeah, there's no question in my mind that this is a woman who is not only going to do the best she can to survive, uh, but to spread the word. And uh, like with martial arts, wait for your chance and don't do anything. <coughs> but when you have a chance, do it. And her witnessing is going to do it. And that's, I think, what she has in mind. Uh, I'd like to jump in with that uh, on that subject. Um, you know, I, I think I commented in one of our previous meetings that um, that uh, the therapist was treating the patient in in role, that is, at that time in the role of soldier, <clears throat> and that roles like the role of soldier do something for the society. Uh, something really important. And one of the things I thought I heard, Sari, in your paradigm shift was a move away from, you know, um, what we might think of as the typical, the typical progressive direction for the patient, that is her well-being, uh, and toward providing her or helping her see that there's a role there that she was in before the, the, the horror of the war and that, and that she is in a sense potentially still in, that is the role of witness, the role of historian. And, you know, um, <clears throat> it's a bit like Freud's love and work. You know, the work is something we do for others really. Um, and <clears throat> in a sense, I think in, reminding her of her potential role, uh, you were in a, in a way helping her combat the terrible effects of the war, as Alexander was saying, the trauma to identity, the stripping away of what, of what you do for others in the world, of your work role. And, and in a sense, her refinding it with you, I thought was wonderful. But I want to add a caveat here, a little, a little, uh, uh, something of concern to me. Um, you know, on the one hand, I think she is a hero. She survived. She's willing to witness what she saw, and I think the work you are doing and the work so many of you are doing is heroic. 
But I also want to add that a hero is a role that we can put you in for our benefit <clears throat> to make us feel better. Um, and, and it's potentially an abandonment of the patient. In other words, this patient may have things to say to you that don't fit the, the role of hero. And she may be witnessing things among her own people that are not heroic at all. And there, there may be a pressure societally and inside herself not to see the things that don't fit the hero narrative. And so I just want to warn us about that as you know, as a, as a counter transference potential on our part. Very good, Jerry. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Uh, um, Jerry, one thing that uh, uh, you remarked upon, uh, not in the, the last time the two of you were uh, discussing the case of Dr. Federitz. You remember at the very end, and you picked this up, uh, one of the participants uh, told us that uh, she had um, begun to learn about trauma and how to work with traumatized people at Maidan in uh, 214. And she worked there, I think, till 218. And then she said this key sentence, and then the foreigners came. Um, and taught us about trauma. And that in itself was traumatizing. And I'm wondering whether this is sort of still, and we never picked up on, on that, and I'm not sure that, the, I don't think this person is here today who said it, but also what role we take, you two take, um, uh, as the Westerners coming in and maybe, um, you know, uh, giving wonderful, uh, recommendations and advice and how much this the the, the role of the the hero but also the flip side of the the, the disturbing foreigner who doesn't know much could uh, could could interfere could be part of that also entire picture yeah. were you thinking of that i wasn't thinking of it right now uh -huh. uh, my last comment but i remember i remember what you're yeah. talking about you yeah at the time, it reminded me of what Francoise and Jean-Max wrote about with the, uh, the children from Theresienstadt. Mm. That is, when they began to form a relationship with the foreigners, they all broke down. That's a, that's a loose association, but it, that's what mm. I found myself thinking back then. Yeah, but you know, we come also from somewhere, uh, from the war. We, I insisted that about that. We were, well, for myself, you, Jerry, you are younger than me. Jerry, you are a young man. Uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm a young man, but not that much younger than you. Okay, so it was the first world, second world war. <laughs> and, uh. and the hero, what we heard about all those heroes, coming back from the war, that they never thought about themselves as heroes. And they knew that people were admiring them and that was not something they thought about themselves. And that's why they were heroic. It is a paradox. They never, you know, uh, and the people who after the war boasting about things were not the real one who had done things. Yeah. I don't know if you have that in Ukraine, but you are not at the end, so we cannot know. What do you think about heroes? Your way to speak about heroes. Do, you, do the people think they are heroic or is it just from outside? I think that's a question uh, addressed to Siri. For, for Seri, Alexander, yeah. Uh, this line does not regard herself as a hero. She thinks of herself as uh, of a witness who can witness the truth. Can I just say a few words? Yeah. 
I would like to say a few words because after 2014 and after the war in 2015 and 16, there were also a lot of injured people, a lot of traumatized patients we had to treat even in, as inpatient. There was this wave, this war wave of patients and the witnesses of Maidan and the war. You know, we have a sad experience with these people because the people who were uh, um, who were thought of as heroic, and especially the witnesses of very of many war events, we know that after that war wave after the life was a little bit back to normal, they had rather serious problems with social isolation mm -hmm. and even loneliness because the society, after these events were over, the society was not that willing to incorporate these roles and acknowledge them. And they were sort of in the way of society. They insisted sometimes uh, on being heroic uh, not in terms of insisting that they were real heroes but they wanted to uh, receive some uh, recognition for the things they did and the society was not willing to acknowledge that and we have we've had internal discussions about that for example in the large groups we were talking we were saying that after the war is over, the uh, the people who are heroes and the witnesses can be uh, not very welcome as witnesses in peacetime. And uh, there may be certain problems associated with that. And we do not have the solutions, the solutions yet of how to process the problems of the heroes that are no longer needed and the witnesses that are no longer needed, and we do not have the solution for that so far. We invent it when it happens, but that's very true what you say, Alexander. That's exactly, you know, those, uh, um, as you say, it's the war, which is, uh, what was your name? Your, your word was, the war is the fact which is unusual and which is, extraordinary out of the everything imaginable. So people who deal with that, when the normal life comes back, usually they are put aside. And so now that you are aware, probably it's very important to be aware of that, to reach them afterward. Usually they, they are, that's, uh, very important, and as as Jerry said, uh, people are not ready to hear the flip side of the wonderful things to say and tell and so on. You know what she? That's why why she felt abandoned and lonely and at at first when she came to have you as a witness of her. Francois, to use your phrase, this is the cut out unconscious in the yeah. making. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just interject one thing? Because it, it does seem to me um, that she was has already been a witness to an unheroic act um, when she hears that the that the uh, Ukrainian uh, soldier, or the Ukrainian who formed, who who uh, collaborated with the Russians, speaks in Ukrainian and pretends it's uh, safe to come out of the basement. So I would imagine that that there are some truths that people will have witnessed that will come out that are, as Jerry says, not very much in sync with uh, the heroic acts we otherwise would love to just uh, you know idealize or collect uh george again uh, uh in keeping with what uh, alexander said um 
it's happened after the Second World War in America, it happened after Korea, it happened after Vietnam. Young boys go to war, and I'm talking about when they're in battle. Young boys go to war and they come back old men. Yeah. They are changed, fundamentally changed. They were there. Okay. Um, people back home read about it in the papers and it was exciting. It's a different story when you're on the front line. And I believe the question of what to do with these poor guys who come back home and they don't feel that they're honored. I don't think it's their problem. I think it's society's problem. And I'm not sure that there's a remedy. Society, if you haven't been in a war, you don't know what it's like to be in a war. And if you have been in a war, you don't know what it's like to not know. That's also why veterans tend to stick together more than they tend to stick with other people in their lives. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that's very true. Mm. But that was why this story is very important. Exactly. Although you saw her seven, seven times. So it's amazing. When we met first, Alexander, you, you say we are in the conditions of war and it's not like psychoanalysis uh, in usual uh, times. You, we have short periods and it's, it's really uh, a concentrate what you did, which pulled her. She changed in the middle. She came from an overwhelmed situation and in seven moment, uh, sessions, she could change radically. And that's, that's psychotherapy or psychoanalysis in the conditions of war. As said uh, George, in, the, in conditions of battle. It's completely another thing. And you have to, to say, I was there too. You were there too, in Kiev, in also in situation of danger. I remember Bion, who had been a, a veteran in First World War. He said, "What when I, he after he was six, 70, 70, he brought back his uh, experience of war, and he said when he practices with kind traumatized or psychotic people, he used to say." I go into action hmm. and I feel the danger. You have to feel the danger. And that's what you say that you feel with her. So thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. I would like to I would like to object very briefly. I don't I don't agree that there is no analytic aspect to that. The analytic aspect is really massive here because we talk about catastrophic narcissistic trauma of the entire population and this narcissistic aspect is present in all therapies, even brief ones. And it appeals to our therapeutic nar narcissistic balancing. Alexander, I said, I never said it was not analysis. I was saying it's the core of psychoanalysis. It's the core. <laughs> I, I'm sorry for my my way of speaking, but I was exactly in your, it's the core. It starts with that, psychoanalysis starts with that. Okay, <laughs> good that there is an agreement. <laughs> um, we, we slowly have to wind down. We have a few more minutes and I'm wondering, um, if there's anybody else in the audience uh, who would like to make a comment or or have has a question, um, if so, please please raise your hand.
Well, that doesn't seem to be the case. So maybe, uh, George, do you still want to say something? You have something else in, on your mind? I just I mean, wanted to clap. It's, it's been a wonderful evening. It's yes. a wonderful presentation. That's all I wanted to do was make that sign. <laughs> yeah. I would, I would uh, this presentation uh, teaches us uh, from what, what Alexander says, the fundamental, you know, psychoanalysis started with Freud and trauma. It was abandoned afterward. So we go back to that first, that's why I say it's the core of psychoanalysis, but with an unconscious, which is not the desire, uh, the repression. It's with cut out experience. In, in order to survive, you have to, yeah. to put that in a body, mm -hmm. uh, in the body, in, in, in an unconscious, which is not repressed. And Freud say that it's an unconscious which is imprinted in the body, hmm. and so that's what you deal with, because the the this woman uh, is her body speaks, her body acts, her her, and this is a fundamental dimension in psychoanalysis which has been forgotten during a long time, as well as its link. I always insist on that with the catastrophes of history. And this is fundamental for psychoanalysis. And so I, I agree with Alexander that what is the psychoanalysis in the conditions of war reveal what has been covered, you know, by, oh, wow. mm. by uh, ordinary teaching, I would say. Mm. And so, I don't, I, I like your uh, uh, vitality to, to, to uh, bear witness, but not only bear witness, to involve yourself, to engage yourself. And so in return, you give us courage because we see people descendant of people who had been at war. And very often they never ask, psychoanalysts never ask, where was your father? Oh, he was in the Algerian war. Ah, never, but the, no analyst asked the question. Uh, very often, history is put out of psychoanalysis. Hmm. Oh, that's what. Uh, thank you to both. Thank you, Francoise. Jerry, do you have uh, some last comments uh, yes, on, uh, before we come to the end? Sandy, uh, do you hear us? Yes, go ahead. Yes, uh, just, we could only hear the last 40 minutes. We didn't I hear saw, the yes. But we want to thank you for these important evenings. And um, if the father is not for the analytics, not <laughs> that's the link that should be in the analytic work, what Francois said. That's, I mean, that's what she meant. <clears throat> Of course, the father is important and there's a link that should be important. Okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's beyond the Oedipus complex. It's about yeah. the history of the, the, and the grandfather the and the ancestors. The Berengers, for example. Yeah. Okay. So Jerry first yes, and sir. then... Two, two quick comments. Uh, uh, Francoise mentioned Dory Laub, yeah. and Dory Laub wrote a paper in which he talks about uh, a patient he worked with when he was in analytic training. At and, Riggs. Uh, at Riggs. Not at Riggs. I think he was huh? no. He, he was he was a he was a uh, candidate in an institute, mm -hmm. and he had his he had his control case, his first patient, and the patient was. Uh, very difficult, attacking him, very critical, uh, and so on. And he noticed something. And that was that the patient got better when Dory's supervisor went on vacation. 
and, and this happened more than once. And what he finally realized was Dore himself had been in a concentration camp. His supervisor had lost people in the Holocaust and neither one of them thought to ask the patient about where her father was for the first five years of her life, which turned out to be he was in a Japanese concentration camp. So this is, this is what you're talking about, Francoise. This is the blind spots that come up in a therapist, between a therapist and supervisor, mm. and the cut out unconscious. Okay, so that's the other thing I wanted, I was reminded of was the famous film director, Luis Bunuel from Spain, once made a comment and the comment was, the artist provides for society an essential margin of alertness. Mm. Alertness. I think, I, without trying to heroicize here, I think our patients do the same thing. You know, um, their vulnerabilities are also from a different angle an alertness to something we're all going through. And, you know, that's, that's important. Mm. Thank you, thank you very much. I, I'm still wondering about that blind, you know, that that I'm still curious about and maybe something will evolve since you still have three sessions with her. I'm still curious about this patient's uh, childhood and about the and about her being lost or or uh, and her abandonment. I, I have a sense you still will find something out. Uh, we do have to stop. Um, I do want to encourage uh, the uh, the English speaking analysts. Uh, we put the two accounts again in the in the uh, chats. Um, if you um, uh, are willing and able to maybe donate some money to a fund that uh, Bernd, who just spoke, um, is managing, with which he is. Uh, buying really important uh, things for the Ukrainians, please do so. Um, and these, you know, can be medication, can be uh, diapers, can be uh, generators. Uh, Bernd always knows the right thing to buy at the right time. And, um, and I know how much Alexander and others uh, appreciate of that. So look in the margins. If you feel like you want to donate, please do so. And we will meet again on uh, April 20th. Not the greatest day in the world, but um, that's the third Thursday in April. And we'll meet again with uh, Ghislaine Boulanger. And thank you so much. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Francoise. Thank you, Alexander, for having found Ziri. And at the end, thank you very much, Ziri, for this important case. Sergei, and thank you. Sergei, really, thank you. It was thank wonderful. You so and Oksana, although we didn't hear uh, you as loudly as when it is live for the wonderful uh, translation all along. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Ziri. Thank you very Thanks much. Everybody.